All right. Well, yesterday we worked on example 8.8, talking about a chemist that decomposes an unknown compound. Let me go ahead and write the, the basics back up on the board one more time. A chemist decomposes an unknown compound, an unknown compound. Remember, part of this is just how to take the word problem and translate it into a math problem, or in this case, a chemistry problem. Decomposes an unknown, and the products of decomposition are 12 grams of carbon. So we're going to carbon, and we have 12 grams and hydrogen, of which we have 4.04 grams. Those are the products of decomposition. What's the chemical formula for the unknown compound? The first thing we're going to do is to look at our products, right? And we're going to construct a potential molecule that could be made from those compounds. As you look across, we see that we are going to decompose a molecule that contains carbons and hydrogens. We don't yet know how many of them. We just know that it includes carbons and hydrogens. Nothing else, because there's nothing else in the product. If it was a decomposition and we had something else as a product, it would have to be in that molecule. So by decomposing this molecule to create these two products, we know that the, comp the molecule itself is made up of those atoms. But we don't know exactly how many carbons, nor do we know how many hydrogens are in the original molecule. And remember, there's all kinds of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen molecule combinations. There's, there's a lot of them. So you can't just look at it and assume you know what it is. So we've got some number of carbons and some number of hydrogens. And this is the case, unlike every other time where we looked at a molecule, where we actually now are trying to determine subscripts instead of the coefficients. Okay? Only when we're trying to when we're trying to uncover, to discover the molecule. Generally, we're given the molecule. And when we're given it, we can't mess with subscripts. We can only mess with coefficients. Here, we're actually going to look at the subscripts. So looking across to our product, remember yesterday, the technique that we used was to go through each of the resulting mass of product and divide each by the molar mass of the compound involved. So in this case, we have 12 grams of carbon. Carbon has an atomic mass of 12 AMUs, meaning that its molar mass is 12 grams per mole. Right? So it's 12.0 grams per mole. And obviously, this is a simple problem because we're learning concept and process here. Later on, it'll be much more complicated. Okay? But this process will be the same. The steps will be basically the same. I have a certain mass of a product. If I divide that element by its, by its molar mass, the number of grams in a mole of that, this will tell me then how many moles of carbon I actually produced. So in this reaction, whatever it is, I produced <coughs> one mole of carbon. See that? Because 12 grams divided by 12 grams per mole results in one mole. So I have my implied one there. I've got one mole of carbon. Now over here, hydrogen. Hydrogen has an atomic mass of 1.01 AMUs. However, it's not in its atomic form. It's in its molecular form because it's a homonuclear diatomic. Hydrogens, oxygen, nitrogens, they're going to come up as N2, O2, H2, and then all of the column seven elements are all going to be homonuclear diatomics. So while hydrogen has an atomic mass of 1.01 AMU, it has a molecular mass here, because it has two of them, of 2.02. .02, right? So there's two different ways you could think about it. The way they do it in the book is they say that they solve for the moles of hydrogen gas, or H2. Well, how many moles of H2? Well, it's 4.04 grams of hydrogen produced divided by, in this case, 2.02 .02 grams per mole of H2. The result there is 4.04 divided by 2.02 .02 .02 is 2. So we have 2 moles of hydrogen gas and 1 mole of carbon produced from the decomposition of this molecule. Now all we're going to do is go back and figure out what the subscripts needed to be in order to produce this many product of each. 
So, in order to decompose one mole of this compound and produce one mole of carbon, what must this subscript be? It's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? Same amount, same amount. If I had a C2, I would expect to find two. If I had a C3, I would expect to find three. But in this case, since I've only produced 12 divided by 12 or one moles, I'm gonna write it in as one right here just so you can see it. But remember, we wouldn't technically write it in there, it's implied. We have one mole of carbon, so our subscript over here on the carbon, again, we wouldn't normally write it, it's implied, but I will in this case, would be a one. Looking over at the hydrogen, how many, how many atoms of hydrogen? Okay. Again, like we can do moles, it produces moles and moles. The tr same truth would be a dozen equals a dozen and two dozen, or one molecule produces one atom and two molecules. Same thing. So if I have one carbon, I have one carbon. It's balanced. Here, I, how many hydrogens do I need? Well, how many hydrogens does it produce? Remember that here, though, it's in the form of a molecule. Here, it's an atomic count, how many atoms, right? So we produce, in this case, two sets of two, which is how many atoms of hydrogen? Four. Two sets of two, or four, hydrogen atoms are produced in this reaction. Or if we're talking about moles, two moles of hydrogen, two molecules are produced. So to, in order to produce four, I need to start with four. And so rewritten appropriately, this implied one goes away, and I would be able to determine that the molecule that was decomposed was a CH4 or methane molecule. Now, as you see in the book in the next section, talking about empirical and molecular formulas, this is pretty straightforward, but there are some wrinkles. It does get a little bit more difficult. If you notice at the bottom there, they give an example of, um, you know, it produces C and 2H2. What's one of the other ones they give in here? A CH4, it could also be, how would we get one carbon and four hydrogens? Well, it could also be, they write in the book, they give these examples, it could be one half of a C2H8 molecule. It could be one third of a C3H12 molecule. See what I'm getting at? In other words, <coughs> what it's proposing here in the book that you consider is that there are more than one way that you could come up with a C H4 multiple. What we're, what we're seeing here is in this decomposition that we're getting some proportion to produce from a certain molecule, and we assume, it may not, maybe not rightly, that the molecule is actually a CH4 molecule. We can also get carbon and hydrogen from other carbon hydrogen chain molecules, and we do that by taking different per percentages of, of them or, or certain proportions of them. So the two definitions you really need to understand on page 298, first of all, a molecular formula, and second of all, the empirical formula. Yes, sir. Chapel, yes, sir. A molecular formula. The molecular formula is something we've been dealing with, with up to this point. You know, what are the number of each atom, each element, that is constituent or part of the molecule we're looking at. In this case, carbon and hydrogen are in the <coughs> methane molecule, and they're in the methane molecule in a one and four combination, right? If I wanna say, how do I make a methane? I take one carbon and four hydrogens. So we're used to this. We're used to looking at it and say, what exactly do I need to make the molecule? That's called the molecular formula. Again, a chemical formula that provides the number of each atom in a molecule. If I look at the C2H8, I know that I have to take two carbons and eight hydrogens to make that molecule. Or the C3H12, I need to take three carbons and 12 hydrogens, and they will come together to make that molecule. 
But now we're adding the wrinkle of what's known as the empirical formula. And the empirical formula doesn't have the same authority that a molecular formula does. And you've got to understand that. The empirical formula is a chemical formula that is basically a very simple whole number ratio of the atoms in a molecule. So what am I getting at? Let's suppose that we're looking at a C3H12 molecule. I would look at that and I would know immediately that this is a molecular formula and not an empirical formula. Why? Well, one way to consider it is this. Look at the carbons and the hydrogens. <coughs> I know specifically for this molecule that I would need three carbons and 12 hydrogens in combination to form the molecule. But if I ask you the question, what is the ratio of carbons to hydrogens in this molecule? Okay, as you looked at it, you would say, well, it's 3 to 12. It's 3 to 12. But we can simplify 3 to 12, can't we? And 3 to 12 becomes... 1 to 4. We look at this and say, what are the common factors between each of these? Well, 3 is a common factor. 3 divided by 3 is 1, and 12 divided by 3 is 4. So these are together in a ratio of, for every one carbon, there are 4 hydrogens. Let's look at this molecule. What is the ratio of carbon to hydrogen? It's 2 to 8. What does that simplify down to? 1 to 4. CH4, what's its ratio? It's 1 to 4, and that doesn't simplify, does it? Okay, So here's, here's the deal. An empirical formula is a formula that simply tells us what the ratio between the atoms and the molecule are going to be. And I'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute, but we have certain experiments, and it'll make sense when we do a review question, hopefully, that... Certain things I can, I can do an experiment and I can determine, hey, you know what? For every mole of one thing, I produce four moles of the other part of that molecule. And the experiment can only tell, only tell me that I produce in a ratio of one to four. But just looking at these three examples, if I told you, hey, I did an experiment and guess what? In the end, I produced four moles of hydrogen for every mole of carbon that was produced. What was my molecule? And your response would be, I need more information. Why? Well, a C3H12 molecule is 1 for 4. A C2H8 molecule is 1 for 4. And a CH4 molecule is 1 for 4. If you told me you produce 1 to 4 in the lab, I don't have enough information. And the key information here, moving from simple ratios to the actual molecular formula, between the empirical formula and the molecular formula, is going to be the molar mass. Because if I then came back and told you, well, I created this many, I started with this many moles of, of something, and I produced this many moles of product in this ratio, you could come back to me and say, well, knowing that it's in this ratio, it, it would potentially be either this molecule, this molecule, this molecule, or this molecule, which one makes sense given the molar mass. Again, concept right now, we'll, it'll hopefully make more sense as we do a practice problem. But the biggest difference is going to be, for example, if you were asked on a quiz or test, okay, <coughs> remember? How do you tell the difference? Is this formula a empirical formula or a molecular formula? And you were given C2H8. Is this an empirical or molecular formula? It's molecular. Why? Because if it were empirical, it would re be reduced down to this. If I give you C3H12, is this empirical or molecular? It's molecular. Why? Because it could be reduced down to this. An empirical formula just shows you the relationship between the amount of each element in the compound. So if I told you that you have an empirical a molecule with an empirical formula of CH4, you should immediately in your mind say, okay, I, I either have CH4, or I have C2H8, or I have C3H12, or I have C4H16, or I have C5H20. It's going to be some combination, some multiple of 1 to 4. That makes it empirical formula. But quite frankly, most of the time, other than the kind of examples we're going to go through in a moment, if you're given 
so like for this case, CH4, is this molecular or empirical? It's, yes, it's both. It's both. Because it could be that you've got a C2H8 molecule, which would have this as its empirical formula, or if you just had methane, this empirical formula is also its molecular formula. See? Again, hopefully by using some examples, it'll make some sense. Example 8 9 just gives us three different molecules and asks us to come up with the empirical formula for the compound. So how do we take the empirical formula? We take the molecular formula and we try to find common factors in the subscripts. What does that look like? Well, here's an example we just covered. C4H12. Is that a molecular formula or an empirical formula? It's molecular. How do you know? Because it, the subscripts can be simplified, can be reduced, right? What is the common factor between the 4 and the 12? 4. And that reduces down to what ratio? 1 to 3. So what would the empirical formula of CH, C4H12 be? CH3. All right? So its molecular formula is C4H12. Its empirical formula is CH3. What does that mean? If in the lab I were to take a certain amount of this molecule and were to decompose it, I would get product in the proportion of one mole of carbon for every three moles of hydrogen. There's more than one molecule that can give me those proportions, but they're all going to be multiples of these subscripts. Or actually multiples of these subscripts, because I could have a C2H6, I could have a C3H9, I could have a C4H12, I could have a C5H15. They would all be molecular formulas that would all be represented by the same empirical formula because any one of those molecules could be decomposed in the lab and produce a product in the relationship of one to three. Okay? One to three. The second one they give us is sodium persulfate, Na2S2O8. Na2S2O8. <coughs> sodium persulfate. Real quickly, is this then empirical or molecular? It is molecular. How do we know? The subscripts can be simplified, right? They can be reduced down. 2, 2, and 8, the first thing to do if you have subscripts and all of them are even, yes, it can be reduced. It can be simplified, right? Because they're all, div they're all even, so they're all at least divisible by 2. Remember that if they don't have a subscript, the subscript is 1. That's odd, which means it doesn't necessarily reduce. But in this case, we have a 2, a 2, and an 8. They're all even. So it, at the least, we could make the empirical what? NaSO4. If we divide every one of them by 2, we now come up with the, and this isn't part of a formal way of doing it, but maybe if we were to write the molecular is that, the empirical is that. What this tells me is if I go and combine one sodium and with one sulfur and four oxygens, I can produce this, but you know what? That's not what I'm actually starting with. When I do the lab and the experiment, I can produce one sodium per sulfur per four oxygens. That'll be the relationship of my molecules and my atoms in my product if it's decomposition, for example. But it doesn't tell me that that's actually the molecule I had. I could have Na1S1O4. I could have Na2S2O8. I could have Na3S3O12. I could have Na4S4O16. Theoretically, I could have all those things. But when I work with them in the lab and I have them measurably decompose, it would be 1, 1, and 4. Again, we'll take the next step of figuring out what, which one of those would be as the next step of this process. Lastly, the potassium dichromate. Potassium, let's K2Cr2O7. <coughs> potassium dichromate, is this empirical or molecular? Yes. It's both, right? It's already an empirical formula. How do I know it's empirical? Can't, can't reduce. There's no common factor between these. We've got two 
two evens and an odd, now that's not the only way to look at that. There might be other multiples in here, but in this case, since they're twos, I've got to have one or two, one or two, <coughs> one or seven. It's a prime number, okay? So the only thing they have in common is one, so there's no action there. I can't divide by one and get anything different, right? So in this case, I can't simplify the subscripts anymore, meaning that this is, first of all, it's molecular formula, but it's also its empirical formula. That doesn't mean, hypothetically or theoretically, that we couldn't have a, a K4CR4O14. We don't, I mean, but theoretically, let's just talk about if we, if we could theoretically have that combination, it would have an empirical formula of K2CR207. But you can't simplify this anymore, which means if I take one molecule of this, I'm going to get 2, 2, and 7 in my decomposition. Okay? That's what I'm going to get. So it's going to be in these, these proportions. So on your own, 8-9 does that again. Do please go over that in your book. Make sure you understand that. 8-9, it gives you five different formulas and asks you, um, are they molecular? And which of them are also empirical? So read the question carefully. Which of the following molecular formulas are also empirical formulas? And it says, if it's not an empirical formula, write the empirical formula. So first of all, identify it. Yes, this is empirical. No, this is not empirical. Second of all, give the empirical if it's not already an empirical form. Now, we mentioned before that one of the ways that we're going to move and use these empirical formulas is also knowing the molar mass, the molar mass. So we'll look at example 810, try to apply this concept of empirical formula and see a little usefulness to it for our everyday chemistry lives, I guess. 810 says a compound's empirical formula is determined by experiment to be C H 2 O. Okay, that's its empirical. New notation just came up with it, E, empirical. Empirical is CH2O. Now, real quickly, let's think about this for a minute. If the empirical is CH2O, what could the molecular be? Actually, the molecular could be several things, right? But the empirical is going to be just one. There's only one empirical formula, but there are multiple possible molecular formulas. So let's look at it. What would be... One possibility for this empirical, what would one, one molecular be? Okay, that's one of them. But let's start simple and build up. In this case, it's 1, 2, 1. What would be the next multiple? C2H4O2. What would be the next one? Be 3H6O3, C4H8O4, c 5, H, 10, O, 5, okay? You get the, get the picture? Okay? This or this or this or this or this. Okay, so there's, and it would go on, right? It could, it could just keep going on forever. Those are all theoretically possible molecular formulas for this one empirical formula. So it says the compound's empirical formula is determined to be CH2O. In a separate experiment, the molecule, the molecule's mass was determined to be 180.1 AMU. So whatever its formula is, its molecular mass is equal to 180.1 AMU. What is the compound's molecular formula? Hmm. Let's go and compute what the molecular mass would be of the empirical formula. Let's start with that. What would be the molecular mass of a CH2O molecule? Well, you can see in the book, they worked it out for us. If you do one carbon, two hydrogens, and an oxygen, you're going to come up with 30.0 AMU. Wait a minute. If this molecule has a mass of 30 AMU, 
and the molecule we're looking for has a mass of 180.1 AMU, what must be the multiple? Well, let's take 180.1 divided by 30, and we get approximately 6. So what I have is, whatever this empirical molecule is, my molecular formula is six times as massive. So I'm going to go through and look at each subscript and multiply it by six. Because I know it's produced from a molecule that has a ratio of one to two to one. And a one to two to one would give me a mass of 30 AMU. But my actual molecule isn't 30 AMU. My actual molecule is 180 AMU. I take what my actual molecule is, divided by the mass of my empirical, configure the multiple, and multi multiply the subscripts in my empirical to get my molecular. Okay. So again, my empirical has 30. My Molecular is six times as massive, so I s multiply the subscripts by the multiple of six. It's interesting that we've been using this term all along, but right now in the text is when they introduce the term molar mass, <coughs> that the mass of one mole of a given compound. We've been using it for the last two modules, right? And that happens oftentimes in chemistry is, is whether the teacher goes ahead or the book go comes back and defines something they've been using. I just want to make sure you understand now, because up until this point, we could have been using molecular mass, right? But now I'm talking molar mass. So here I use the molecular mass of AMUs. I could have come back with you and said, OK, this, this sample of this uh, one mole of this molecule has a mass of 30 grams. And the molecule is determined to have a molar mass of 180 grams. Well, you do the same math. It's still whatever the mass of my, whatever the actual mass of the molecule is in whatever units, individuals, it's molecular in whole mole, it's molar, divided by whatever the empirical is, gives you a multiple, and you multiply each subscript by that multiple to get your actual. And this is actually glucose, by the way. <coughs> sugar, a form of sugar, so glucose. Let's do one more example, and then sure. Actually, eight ten. Let's do eight ten first. In one example or one experiment, excuse me, the empirical formula of a compound is determined to be sodium, it's just going to be NaPO4. It's the empirical. An empirical NaPO4. In a separate experiment, the molar mass is determined to be 350, 354 grams. What's the molecular formula? So what am I going to do? Ma'am? Molar mass of the empirical. 118 grams per mole. Or PO4 molecule phosphate. We'll keep it together. I'm assuming that's what they did in the answer key. Let me look at it. But you could see if you had a P3O12, you would still have an accurate count. <coughs> 
of all of the elements. Tim, is that what they offer? Right. In, in the key, they solve for it to be NA3P3O12, like we just did. And then they said you could also correctly write it. This is more correctly write it as Na3 quantity PO4 3. So. But then the process is the same. Take the empirical, the molar mass of the empirical, the molar mass by experiment of the molecular, you know, a lot of M's here, but maybe that's molecular molar mass, the empirical molar mass. Kind of looks like mountain range now. I lost my number of squigglies there. How's that? The empirical molar mass. You divide the molar molar mass by the empirical molar mass, and you end up here with the mol molecular formula. Example 811 is the same thing. No process difference. It's just the empirical is PO3. The mass is 79 AMUs. The actual has 158, which is half. In other words, the multiple becomes 2, and it's P206. It's pretty straightforward. Um, five, more mi five more minutes. Let's go ahead and look at example 812. It's the last example given in the book. And it takes this idea and pushes it just a little bit farther. Let's look, let's look at that one quickly. Example 812. A sample of brown-colored gas is decomposed into 2.34 grams of nitrogen. So something is decomposed into 2.34 grams of nitrogen and 5.34 grams of oxygen. What's the empirical formula of the compound? Well, I'm going to look at it and see that I've got some, we've got nitrogen and oxygen. You see that? We decompose it and we get nitrogen and oxygen, so we've got to start with nitrogen and oxygen. It's decomposing a molecule, so we'll bring the two atoms together, the two elements together, with XY subscripts. Now, just like before, we were told, okay, I've got a certain number of moles and a certain number of moles. Now I've been given grams and grams. Can I relate grams and grams? Not stoichiometrically, right? So what do I have to do? I've got to translate it in something I can actually compare stoichiometrically. So I need to convert grams to moles. So when I convert it from grams to moles, what am I going to have to do? We have to divide each of these by the molar mass of those elements. Right? So nitrogen, nitrogen here as an N2 molecule, how much mass does a nitrogen molecule have? Shortcut looking at the book, we've got 28 AMU per molecule, right? 28 per molecule, because we're looking at N2, not N. N2 has 28, well, it's AMUs, but it's grams per mole, too, grams per mole. And so when I divide 2.34 by 28, I end up with, and here's where it gets a little bit, where you've got to know the process and just keep following the process, 0 0.0836 moles of N2. And dividing oxygen by its molecular molar mass, we get 0 0.167 moles of O2. Now, this is where if you don't understand the process, you start wigging out. Wait a minute. 0 0.0836 and 0 0.167? I'm trying to figure out a molecular formula for all of that. How could I possibly simplify those two things. Well, what we're going to do is since we're only trying to find a relationship, we're not looking for the actual number, we're looking for a relationship. We would go through and the technique is to look for which of these two is smaller. 0 0.0836 or 0 0.167, which is smaller? The first one, right? This is a little bit more than 8 tenths, or excuse me, yeah, 8, eight hundredths. This is a little bit more than you know, 1600s. So what I'm going to do is take every one of these coefficients, because I've got fractional coefficients, and we don't like fractional coefficients, right? 
That's what a decimal represents. I'm going to divide every one of them by the smallest one that I have. In this case, 0 0.0836. 0 0.0836. And when I do the math, something amazing happens. This becomes 1. And what's this one become? Now, now that I've done that one step, now that I've divided by the smallest fractional coefficient, I come back with, now I'm look, trying to relate one mole of nitrogen gas and two moles of oxygen coming from one mole of this molecule. What must my subscripts be? X must be two, because I've got two in the product, and what must my oxygen be? Four. Now. N2O4. But that, but these kind of experiments it's going to tell you in here can only determine the empirical formula. What we have here is actually a molecular formula. We have to convert this into, a, into the empirical formula. So the empirical formula here would be NO2. 